Well, it's a pleasure to leave the high living and low thinking of Dallas <coughs> and come up to the low living and high thinking of Deerfield. <laughs> Susan Nyman has become one of my favorite authors. And I'll begin with a short quotation from her. She says, my field, which is actually philosophy, and we'll add in theology, isn't known for much reflection on actual events. Thank you. So I want to begin informally with a personal anecdote. Two summers ago, when I was traveling in Europe, I got a call from my daughter telling me that my wife, Muriel, had fallen, broken her hip, and been admitted to hospital. Happily, the ensuing operation was a success, although it was touch and go whether I should come back from the trip to Europe. After a few days, Muriel was moved over to the rehab center, Presbyterian one, I should say, close to the hospital. And then I got the surprising news. Muriel had suddenly asked, when's my husband coming back? Now, why this surprising, even astonishing news? Well, here's why. For six years, Muriel had suffered from a rare psychological condition known as Capgras syndrome. This is a condition where there's radical cognitive failure in perception and memory directed on one person. And that person was me, her husband. Over time, we had come to terms with this bizarre condition not go into all the details. On my part, it was a matter of simply accepting this rare condition and living with it as best I could. On Muriel's part, she had dealt with it by creating a profile of two Billies. Now, I'm not Billy Bob, it's Billy. One Billy who had been her husband but who had died and gone away, or gone away. And the other Billy, a Billy who had turned up uninvited and became a guest in the home. Now, the really good news was that both Billies were nice. However, there was now <clears throat> only one Billy, and the only issue was when was he getting back from his travels in Europe? And I, of course, I wondered whether the extraordinary recovery had, had exhibited a complete reversal from what it had been for six years. And naturally, this was a matter of deep gratitude to God that Muriel had been healed of a bizarre and in many respects extremely unpleasant disease. Now, as I've told this story on various occasions, it's been interesting to observe the way in which people have described this happy event. The most popular response in Christian circles is to describe what has happened as a miracle. On this analysis, we're dealing with a special supernatural act of God. Or, to put it in Humean terms, if you read the footnotes in Hume, which are not often read and should be read, we're dealing with a violation of a law of nature brought about by God or other invisible agent. That's the part that gets left out. Yet a few have reached for a non-miraculous description. Namely, what happened was simply a natural event where the current state of research has no idea what the potential laws are which were instantiated. And this was reflected in our doctor's very reluctant concession that something maybe equivalent to shock therapy had jolted the brain into restoring memory cells that had somehow ceased to operate. And my own favorite way of stating this option was to simply suggest that the operation simply in the brain, and the operation uh, suggested in the operation the brain had been shut down and that in the rebooting that followed after the operation the memory cells had been reactivated. So two options emerged. Either a miracle or a natural event. In the first case, <clears throat> what the vul vulgar call a divine intervention or a miracle or more or less vulgarly a basic act of God. In the second, we have a natural event where there's no reference to divine action at all. Now, we can re remedy this lacuna, the absence of reference to divine action, by re-describing the events in terms of classical concepts that crop up in the doctrine of providence. 
By providence, I mean here generally that class of acts where God acts for our good by taking into account his long-term goals and our best interests. I think that's the very basic meaning of the term providence, namely that God provides for the needs of his creation and his creatures. So it is standard usage minimally to think of providence as involving the following. God's conservation and preservation of the natural order, God's working concursively in, with, and through natural occurrences, and God's active rule or governance with respect to natural evil, in this case, the natural evil of Capgras syndrome. So within this classical orientation, it's then common to distinguish between extraordinary providence and ordinary providence. So descriptions of our case study would then treat the miracle option in terms of extraordinary providence and the natural event option in terms of ordinary providence. And the great advantage of this fresh way of conceptualizing the issue is that it reworks the option so that divine action shows up in both descriptions. And we're no longer looking upon the natural event description as an expression of some kind of deistic depiction of the divine world relation. Appeal to divine providence is important and helpful because it narrows the range of divine actions involved. Now this is crucial because if we speak merely of divine action, in fact we're saying next to nothing unless we begin to specify the actions predicated of God. Now I have argued this case elsewhere in terms of the concept of action arguing that it is a radically open concept. I mean by this that there are no non-trivial necessary conditions for action, even though there are varied accounts of how to capture significant sufficient conditions for our deployment of action discourse. Intentionality is usually the favored one to go for. In this respect, the concept of action is like the concept of event or happening. Its great usefulness depends precisely on its radical openness, and it allows us to say that some action was performed, or some event took place, without our committing ourselves on what actually was done, or what actually happened. Now, I think we need such general concepts. I think I learned that lesson from J.L. Austin many, many years ago. However, their very generality means that without further specification, we're in danger of saying next to nothing. So the temptation at this stage to semantic, intellectual, and explanatory delusion has been well, near, well nigh inescapable in a host of treatments of the so-called problem of divine action over the last hundred years or so. And the antidote to this is to begin specifying what we think God has done from the bottom up and then finding ways to classify various acts of God, say, acts related to divine revelation, acts related to salvation, or acts related to providence. And by moving in this direction, we begin then to get a grip of what we want to say theologically, rather than taking refuge in vague generalities. Now, having said all that, I want to return to the stark disjunction that I gave earlier when I spoke of our options being a miracle or a natural event. In this line of thinking, I sought to capture what one often encounters when ordinary believers first seek to identify what's happened. Ordinary believers rarely reach for the intricate ruminations on providence that I've just ruminated and even mildly applauded. In fact, I think the terrific loss in the concept of providence in general, sort of like everyday uh, uh, ecclesial discourse, and I'm sure there are historians who've worked on that. And I want to return to this way of thinking because I think this earlier vulgar way of thinking highlights an immediate problem that many ordinary believers instinctively feel once they think about their commitments. Thus, while they're surely happy to speak of thanking God, if we take this as a miracle, they ponder, they wonder if they can legitimately do so if they take what's happened as a natural event. Put more felicitously, but not too strongly, they feel more intellectually secure in thanking God in the case of a healing seen as a miracle than a healing seen as a natural event. 
Now, I am here, of course, in typical philosophical fashion, seeking to bring to the surface an interesting problem that I think is either missed or underdeveloped in, in discussions of divine action and healing. And we might put the issue this way. If the healing is a natural event, can we with authenticity and consistency give thanks to God for what has happened? After all, there's no reference to divine action. Maybe we're just being super pious and engaging the practice of rendering thanks to God for this surprising but entirely natural turn of events. If our prayer of thanksgiving is to be fully coherent, surely it might be said, it requires a prior description of the healing as a supernatural event. So it may seem odd to thank God for something which can so readily be described without any initial reference to divine action. Now, how might we work our way out of this interesting philosophical maze? We could, of course, find an appropriate exit by taking up my move to describe the natural event in question as in a case of ordinary rather than extraordinary providence. But this, takes, this certainly takes care of the worry that we are giving thanks to God for something that's not tied conceptually to any reference to divine action. And we solve that by reference to ordinary providence. So far, so good. However, I think there's a much more interesting way to come to terms with our puzzle. It's more interesting because it brings to the surface crucial features about the nature of explanations, causal explanations, as applied to action, that applies not only in the case of human actions, but I think applies also in the case of God. And furthermore, this line of thinking I propose leads very naturally to the identification of a more general challenge that deserves attention in future work on divine action. So at this stage, to speak as an Irishman, we're now getting into the meat and potatoes of my presentation. <clears throat> to date, I've simply been laying the tablecloth and getting out the cutlery. <clears throat> so here it goes. <clears throat> when we seek to explain why this or that event or action takes place, we deploy, I propose, our informal conception of causation. Why did my house burn down on Halloween last year? No, it didn't, but we're doing a thought experiment. Well, Erasmus, that clever but lazy student in my seminar on divine agency, decided to take revenge for the low grade that I had assigned in the midterm paper. So, he took some gasoline and a lighter and did the deed. Yet, he was not the only causal agent involved in what had happened. Aside from the gasoline and the lighter, and the agents at the gas station who supplied these when he brought, bought them the day before, there was also the wind that took the flames rapidly into the roof space. And then there was the dry rot in the rafters. And then the gas that erupted once the pipes had sort of been sort of opened up. So there was not one cause, not one agent, but a network of agents, each making their unique contribution to the fire that consumed my house. In speaking of Erasmus as the cause, which we do, what we're doing is picking out the most significant cause in a network of causes. Here is the one who, in the context of the legal trial, is found to be responsible and gets the blame. Yet he was not the only cause or agent involved. Now return now to the healing of my wife. There are at least five agents to be identified. There is the patient, Muriel, who had to sign off and agree to the operation. There'd be no operation if that had not happened. We know all the laws related to that. There are the doctors and the nurses who performed the operation. There's the body and the brain which were subject to intervention by the doctors and the nurses. They're what I'm going to call the medical agents that were administered both before, during, and after the operation. And, surely, God, the one and only creator and sustainer of the universe and all its creatures. Depending on the context, we pick out the relevant agent for special attention as the cause of the healing. So medical researchers are thrilled as the new, drugs which have, uh, the new drugs which have worked exactly as specified and whose recurring success 
advances their careers in the company they work for. We send the doctors and the nurses thank you cards for the amazing skills that they have employed. And here's the crucial move in the context of worship, where we acknowledge our utter dependence upon God for the very air that we breathe. Herbert Butterfield, if God stopped breathing, the world would fall apart. <clears throat> in the context of worship where we are articulating our dependence upon God, we thank God for the healing, the healing that I'm reading in this case as an entirely natural event or theologically as an act of ordinary providence. So our account of the logic of causation, rather than a mere description in terms of providence, gives us a deeper and more illuminating account of why it is entirely appropriate to give thanks to God for a healing which does not involve a case of miracle or extraordinary providence. And by the way, the very same logic is at work when we recite the Lord's Prayer. It's nice to bring up Jesus in a philosophy presentation, isn't it? <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread. Hmm. We say in all sincerity. And then we pop around to the French bakery to buy a fresh loaf for our noonday sandwiches. <laughs> There's no need to posit some kind of miracle in such cases. We're deploying our informal sense of how the language of causation as predicated of God works naturally in that particular case. Now, of course, as a good old-fashioned, sort of like unreconstructed, unapologetic supernaturalist, if we do experience a miraculous supply of bread, and by the way, the only case I know is a Jesuit, charismatic Jesuit in uh, El Paso, who is said to have witnessed the multiplication of loaves among the poor. I think that's an interesting case. And I, I, I haven't got the reference for that, but I, I know I have it somewhere in the back of my floppy disk in my head. If we do experience a miraculous supply of bread like the feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospels, we may be more inclined to thank God for giving us on that day our daily bread. However, this merely displays that our piety is insufficiently informed by our vision of creation and providence. It does nothing to undermine the logic of appeal to divine action in cases where we give thanks to God for the provision of our daily bread from the bakers around the corner. Now, this is where it gets difficult. If you agree in broad terms with the analysis that I've just articulated, then I ask you to consider its obvious application to a long-standing problem in doctrines of the Christian life. By the way, all of this is about what God does in the Christian life in terms of providential care or healing, and we're going to get eventually to divine action and salvation. And we're close to that right now. And I have in mind the tension between grace and freedom. The issue is a simple one. If salvation is of grace, then it's brought about by God. Thus we can take no credit or make any claim to merit on our part. Yet there's no salvation without, at the very least, human freedom, represented, say, by consent. Even Augustine, good old Gusty, as I sometimes refer to him, <laughs> in his most austere later period, had to admit this much. <clears throat> However, once we allow any human action the worry is, then we can claim credit and merit. Or as Paul Helm puts it, it's pride allowing. It's credit allowing. So the Western tradition as a whole has been very clear on how to resolve the dilemma. Sacrifice freedom and hold on to the standard doctrine of grace. And if you're really sophisticated, you develop a thoroughgoing doctrine of compatibilism in order to sort of bring home the goose at Thanksgiving. <laughs> now, once again, deeper attention to the logic of causation, I think, can resolve this long-standing dilemma. Consider a standard case of conversion. Characteristically, there are at least three agents involved. There's the agent of the church that has preserved the gospel, and the agents of the church who bear witness to the gospel and preach the gospel or gossip the good news about Jesus. After all, faith comes by hearing. And how can we hear 
if there's no preacher. So there's the agencies involved in the life and agencies or persons of the church, and the practices of the church. Then there's the agency of the sinner. He or she starts reading the scriptures. They listen to testimonies. They accept the invitation to go to church. And they actually pay attention to the sermons preached. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> By the way, in my own case, when I was a befuddled atheist, I had a bad dose of intellectual measles, and I decided to think about Christianity for three months. And what I did is I sat in the balcony of my church, and during the sermon, I got out the hymn book and pretended to be reading the hymn book, listening to every word that was being said. <laughs> and I did that. God did not, dare I say it, do that. <laughs> so <clears throat> they begin reflecting on their past lives. They start facing up to the reality of sin across the years, reflecting on that. They fitfully think about repentance. They consider, maybe for the first time, the amazing promises of the gospel. John Wesley said, the whole of the gospel is one massive promise, beautiful phrase. They struggle to ward off the temptation to turn and run. They initiate a series of conversations with a faculty member at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. <clears throat> they decide to turn, to repent, and follow Christ as Lord and Savior. And at last, possibly reluctantly, they submit to the invitation to be baptized and to join the church. That's a long list of the actions of the human agent involved, the sinner. And then, of course, there is the agency and action of the triune God who works to draw the sinner by the cords of love, who inwardly convicts the human agent of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, who sustains and guides the church, its members, and its, mem and its, its members in their work of witness. And the triune God, the God who provides in the person of the Son a Savior who dies for the sins of the whole world, and who provides in the person of the Comforter, brings about the new birth, and supplies assurance through the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, and on and on and on. So there's much more involved that, that, involved that begin, can begin to be captured in the theological abstractions of grace and freedom. We have three distinct agents who perform a host of varied actions. The slogan, we are saved by grace, is apt, but not as a way of creating what I consider to be the pseudo-problem of grace and freedom, but as a magnific magnificent way of, of picking out by far the most significant agent in the total process, causal process, that is at stake in salvation. It is God who saves us and not we ourselves, we say. To speak of merit and credit in the actual context simply fails to capture the sinner's joy at divine mercy and that the divine action that has gone into entering the kingdom of God and being initiated into the life of sanctification and of the church. And I say this even as I've had one to provide a lengthy list of imperatives that show up in scripture and in robust accounts of the Christian life, which highlight the host of human actions that the human agent is called upon to perform before, during, and after initiation into the life of God. Now, to put the issue really sharply, God does not perform our acts of hearing. God does not get our butt out of bed on a Sunday morning and get us to hear the preacher. God does not, bring a, God does not do our repentance. <clears throat> God, does not bring, God does not perform the act of turning to the Savior or our trust in the promises or our active reception of the sacraments and participation in the means of grace or our struggles, God does not perform our struggles against evil and sin, our resistance to the devil, and so on. So what I want to, what's, in, what's buried in this is that uh, I think we need just massively more work on the human agent and the actions that are performed and how we're going to sort of really provide not just your standard views of free will, those are important, but I think we've got to go a lot deeper in terms of the theological anthropology that's at stake here and develop a really robust conception of human action, human agency, and indeed human powers. Hence, when Eleanor Stump 
proposes that the only act we can really perform on our side in salvation is the equivalent of a child passively receiving food into its mouth after exhausting itself in the high chair in resistance. We have wandered, I say, into fantasy land generated by doctrines of grace that have lost touch with reality. We need robust doctrines of human action and agency in thinking about the Christian life. And we can entertain and articulate such doctrines, A, when we come to terms with the logic of causation as sketched above in the case of divine healing, and when we consider the case of salvation, which on the divine side is marked by the glorious interventions involved in incarnation, atonement, resurrection of the Son, and then the splendid and varied divine action in Pentecost and its aftermath in the work of the good and life-giving Holy Spirit. Now, if I'm broadly right here, I've argued that we can be begin to understand why there's been so much confusion at both a popular and academic level when it comes to ascribing divine action to events in our daily lives and, I would say, in our contested accounts of salvation and grace. On the one hand, we have a rich network of concepts and doctrines that seek to capture the riches of the tradition on divine action. And on the other hand, we have the sheer complexity, diversity, and messiness of our lives across space and time. And it's not always easy to map the former in ways that will actually fit the latter. This is really where I'm sort of wanting to open the initial problem into a wider one. And I can illustrate this vividly in a personal case with respect to the application of providence, where there was no healing. When my son Timothy was admitted to hospital in May 2012, I was again traveling in Europe and got the news after spending a wonderful evening with Professor David Brown in his home close to the University of St. Andrews. The doctors had insisted that I come home immediately, for the situation was dire. In the journey back, a journey I will never forget, I prayed first that Timothy would still be alive when I got back, and secondly, that at some point he would wake up from the induced coma and I could tell him how much I loved him. Both of these prayers were not answered. Folk across the world were praying for his healing, including a group of children in Kathmandu in Nepal. <laughs> now, I don't mind if God doesn't listen to my prayers, but I think he listens to the prayers of little children. <laughs> I could say, yet I could see, here's the astonishing thing, I could see the hand of providence in a host of developments. My own answered prayer for him to be alive and wake up long enough to tell him that I loved him the extraordinary love and care of the members of my church and of the two adult Sunday schools that I teach on the weekends, the amazing fortitude of my family, especially of Timothy's sister Siobhan, when we had to switch off the life support and stay for four hours to watch him die, and so on. It was amazing to watch what, what Siobhan did. And, and I was really worried that it would break Muriel, and it didn't. All her old sort of capacities as a nurse kicked back in. <clears throat> Yet he was not healed. And at the time, I could no way see any act of providence in his death, either for him or for our family. That was back then. Now, later, I have my own sense of assurance that this was indeed best for Timothy even though the details, hear me, are a matter of private reflection rather than any kind of public exposition. As in the case of Mary, these matters are best left to be pondered in silence in our hearts. So there's a case where when you're trying to apply providence to the messiness of human existence and human life, it's not easy and you've got to be patient. Now, given difficulties like these, our concepts, divine action, and the messiness of human existence and the Christian life, it's natural that theologians would seek to find ways to sweep away the challenge of mapping our language of divine action onto our lived experience. 
Now, one way to do this is to limit, say, miracles to the past, say, to the great stretches of special divine revelation represented by the Exodus event, the beginning of the times of the great prophets, and the events in and around the Incarnation. In this way, a way beloved by some reformed historians of church history, we can then ignore, systematically ignore, the challenge of dealing, say, with the possibilities of miracle in current expressions of Pentecostals. Now, I have to make a confession, the Pentecostals are the great-grandchildren of the Wesleys. And if you've got great kids like that, grandchildren like that, who are the largest, most, one of the largest growing and one of the most lively forms of Christianity in the contemporary world, Wesley's got a pretty good pedigree if you run him forward. <laughs> All right, Tom, you agree? <laughs> <laughs> now, the underlying assumption is that God has a general policy of limiting miracles to times of special revelation. That's initially plausible, but I think it's ultimately implausible, and I'm not going to try and argue that here. There's a more interesting way to avoid any, any of the messiness involved. A more radical way is to abandon all talk of divine direct, direct divine action in the world and history, and to limit divine action to what God does, if you like, in, with, and through natural events and human actions. It's sort of like entirely a matter of God working concurrently with ordinary historical and natural events. And the story goes like this. God does indeed perform special acts in history, but they're to be identified not by predicating any direct acts of God, say, in divine speaking or miracle. They're to be identified by the depth of response that is evoked by certain events that are otherwise entirely matters of nature and history, or, in traditional terms, acts of ordinary providence. Think of it this way. God is active and present in snails and slugs. And God is active in Jesus and the saints. But there's no, on this view, categorical difference in the actions, of God, the actions that God performs in either case. And consider again the case of our daily bread. It's no less a matter of divine action, it will be said, even though we, ground the, we go round the corner and get the bread from the ovens of the local bakery. What makes the difference, it will be said, is our response to Jesus and the saints compared to our response to snails and slugs. Now, you can take it, I don't like snails and slugs, or snakes. Just keep snakes out of here. It's a matter, it's a natural and appropriate depth of our response that leads us to speak in the case of one and not the other. And in this way of thinking, we can also accommodate acts of extraordinary providence by simply thinking of them as marvels and signs, good biblical term, rather than miracles in the traditional sense. What marks out special acts of God is then the depth of response rather the kind of divine action involved. Now, leaving aside the epistemological motivation that often lies behind these moves, I want to make two objections. First, notice that in speaking very generally of special acts of God, its adherents steadily refuse to specify the actual divine actions that are, that are in truth being eliminated from the Christian tradition. What's actually being eliminated are such acts as the Incarnation, any sense of the miracles of the Gospels, the Transfiguration, the Resurrection of Jesus, and the remarkable events surrounded in the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. By the way, if you want all this, read the works of one of my esteemed teachers, Morris Wiles. <clears throat> Thus, it was relatively easy to conceal that you were dropping all that material by deploying more general language of special acts in a way that trades on the similar and long-standing generalities about divine action that have littered the, littered the literature. As I like to press the issue spec a sour play again, unless we specify the actual divine actions that are involved, we have no idea what we're being asked to believe or disbelieve. And this rule applies in claims about special divine action. We need to know special with respect to what and we need to know what specific actions are in mind. But there's a deeper worry 
Ask yourself this question. What are the truth conditions for the networks of the special acts of God that I've just enumerated? By the way, I have to confess, I owe this point to one of your former students, Felipe Duval. <clears throat> so two cheers, three cheers for Felipe, who is a remarkable student. <laughs> and he gave me this way of thinking about it. And I thought, oh, I'm going to steal that. Now I have to give credit, right? <clears throat> now, what's the, the truth condition, say, for the resurrection of Jesus? And by the way, the resurrection is not just the resurrection of Jesus. It's God raising Jesus from the dead. That's what Hume forgot. Well, the truth condition is that God actually performed that action. Note that the truth conditions are not the relevant responses that these acts of God may or may not evoke. We don't even call them special acts of God because they evoke some kind of special, deep, pious response on our part. They are special because in doing this or that specific action here is related to some standard of relevance about what God has actually done, in this case, for the salvation of the world. So, on my view, we cannot substitute discourse about our response as a serious articulation of the meaning of discourse about divine action in these cases. And the causal story is back to front. The acts of God evoke a deep response among believers because, precisely because they're perceived as acts of God. It's not the case that we call the special acts of God, the special acts of God, because we find ourselves somehow responding to ordinary acts of providence in a deep or profound way. Consider an analogy. An academic friend of mine took a tour of houses in Highland Park in Dallas. Afterwards, afterwards he made the witty comment, outside Dallas, houses are expensive because they're valuable. In Dallas, houses are valuable because they're expensive. You've got the thing back to front. Just ponder that. <laughs> now, I've strayed a bit from my central point in this part of my presentation, but understandably so. I've pursued the line that some theologians in part seek to limit or abandon the range of possible divine actions because they want to avoid the demanding task of mapping our rich concepts of divine action onto our very messy lived experience. And so in this final session, a section, I want to drive this home by looking at the difficulty of mapping our con commitments on the particularities of divine action, on the messiness of our lived experience of salvation. Consider the following fascinating range of divine actions that crop up in treatments of salvation in the doctrine of a Christian life. We speak of new birth, of regeneration, justification, sanctification, adoption into the family of God, witness of the Holy Spirit, divine forgiveness, the illumination of the Holy Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit. You notice all three Gospels say that the purpose of the coming of Jesus was to, all four Gospels, was to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. What are we going to do with all those Wesleyans and Pentecostals who talk about that stuff? Huh? It's a very interesting act of God. Now, I've used nouns but they're placeholders for divine action. And now consider our difficulties in mapping these diverse divine actions onto the lived experience of the believer. So we ask, how far are these divine actions represented or correlated with conscious experience in the life of the believer? This challenge was highlighted in 1909 in a remarkable paper by the Methodist theologian Borden Parker Bowne, who you've never heard of. <laughs> but now you know about him. <laughs> he was one of our best from the United States, and they sent him off to Germany. He worked with um, Lotze, I think it was. <laughs> yeah, Tom knows. And then brought liberal Protestantism of a certain kind back to the United States and wrecked Methodism. <laughs> did more damage than the English did when they came over after the Irish had brought Methodism to America. <laughs> but Bowne put his finger on a very interesting problem. Bowne had taught Methodist students and seminarians for a generation and was a keen observer of the testimonies of ordinary lay believers. He noticed that many of them had lived exemplary Christian lives, but to their embarrassment or shame, had never experienced many of the experiences that had been taught as constitutive, say, 
of the witness of the Holy Spirit or of sanctification. Phoebe Palmer, on the more conservative side of the tradition, had wrestled with the same issue in her experience and treatment of entire sanctification. Now, Barnes' solution was drastic. First, we need to distinguish, he says, between abstract theological theory, represented by vivid metaphor, and be the complexity of conscious Christian experience. Second, the varieties of religious experience were to be given logical prior to priority over the theological abstractions, so much so that any reference to divine action is effectively idling in treatments of the Christian life. And third, the way forward was to moralize Christian teaching generally and treatments of the Christian life in particular so that what really mattered in the end were moral decisions to follow Christ and a subsequent life of moral endeavor to follow the teachings of Christ in love for God and neighbor. Bowne is fascinating in the way he's trying to get around this. All these wonderful pious Methodists who've never known a day, say, when they didn't love Jesus, and who've never had any sense of assurance of the sort that was talked about in the revival meetings and so on and so forth. But the issue is, how do you take these really interesting network of divine actions and map them onto the issue, the, our lives? Now, of course, the crucial objection at this stage is that it effectively eliminates any robust reflection on the heritage of specific divine actions. The language depicting the pertinent divine action is to be treated as metaphor. That is ultimately, I suspect, bereft of informative or cognitive content. But that's a mistake, as many have pointed out, including Janet Martin Soskis. If I say it's raining cats and dogs, it's entirely truthful statement about the world, <laughs> yet it's a metaphor. <laughs> so we can use speech acts that involve metaphor to describe and explain what's going on in reality. And I think that, I think, is what's going on, as I've said, in cases of divine action and salvation. Now, we can try to solve the problem and involve, involve maybe in one of two ways. I'm, I'm, I'm close to the end here. Now, the philosophers in our midst, and I feel guilty, I'm guilty, I'm one too at times, on Tuesdays and Fridays. Uh, this is what day? This is Thursday, so I'm not sure what I am. <laughs> we can try to link up the regional problem of the relationship between concepts and reality by revisiting long-standing philosophical debates about the relationship between concepts and reality. So we can go back to Plato and Aristotle and universals, on the dispute between realists and nominalists in the Middle Ages, differences between idealists and realists in the 19th century, and quarrels about realists and deconstructionists in the 20th century. Now, I would never say that we can't learn from that, those debates. But if theological abstraction is not going to help us, <laughs> I think metaphysical abstraction is just going to take us further into la-la land, and I don't want to go there. <laughs> the other way forward, possibly, is to, is to develop a robust version of sacramentalism and insists, say, that such divine actions as regeneration and baptism in the Spirit supervene on the human actions that occur in water baptism. So we could put the issue this way. On the occasion of the appropriate practice of water baptism, God brings it about that the human subject is born again and baptized in the Spirit. As the standard causal formula runs, the sign brings about that which it signifies. Bowen, a seer, sincere and pious Methodist, rejected all of that. <laughs> In this, he went way beyond the actual position of John Wesley, blessed John, who retained a commitment to baptismal regeneration, even as he developed an account of new birth phenomenologically and psychologically that undercut his views of the sacrament of baptism as applied to infants. Similar problems with respect to how to think experientially of baptism in the spirit haunt current efforts in charismatic and Pentecostal and post-Pentecostal circles to make sense of the promise and fulfillment of the promise, that promise in the New Testament. And the acute difficulty is obvious. Now, I'm going to leave you with a pain in the brain, in other words. There's work to be done here. <laughs> there are spiritual experiences that cry out to be interpreted in terms of new birth and baptism in the spirit that are temporally distinct from baptism in water and these spiritual experiences are indeed conscious and datable. 
And the best theologians working on this sometimes, I think, are in fact contemporary Catholic charismatics. It was a very interesting problem. Now, it's too late in the day, I have two minutes left, <coughs> to indicate how we might make genuine progress in mapping our concepts of divine action onto the vicissitudes of Christian experience of salvation. Say they, well, I'll extend the healing now to include the healing of our souls in salvation and reach for that therapeutic type of image. <coughs> But the desiderata are clear. We need to keep in place our robust commitment to genuine, specific divine actions, pursued initially in terms of analogy with, reverent, with relevant analogues. And we need to reckon with the real messiness and complexity of spiritual experience. And that work, I think, needs to be done in conversation with classical material in what Protestants have called piety, or spirituality, or what in the classic Catholic tradition has been called ascetic theology. And we need to work with the testimonies of Christians across space and time, and across the whole denominational spectrum. Now, if I have succeeded in making some progress in this lecture with mapping our discourse of divine healing and providence onto in our experience of healing, then we should entertain hopes that progress can be made on this wider challenge represented by the problem that I've highlighted in this concluding section of my lecture, namely all of these really wonderful uh, proposals and claims about what God does in salvation, and how are we going to relate that to the messiness of, of our own experiences and provide at least an intelligible, illuminating account of all of that. So, onward and upward in our efforts to map our claims about divine action including our experiences of healing, onto the messy reality of lived experience. Thank you very much.